Well, and, th and that's certainly a difficulty. Um, you know, that n you're not necessarily going to have as uh, wide open of a debate as, as I would like to see at times. Uh, partly because some people believe in objectivity or some people, there are, there are obviously ways that there are biases in various departments and fields uh, and at various universities. Uh, but it's important in many ways to protect that. For example, at, uh, I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, which is legendary for its Chicago School of Economics, which has become deeply influential in, in our economic world today. Uh, but for many years, the Chicago School of Economics was very much an outlier in the realm of academia. And if you were to look at the University of Chicago School of Economics and compare it to other schools of economics, you would see that it didn't seem to have these liberal thinkers or this diversity of ideas. It was a very hardcore conservative economic approach. And while I might criticize that, in fact I do, uh, I, I think that it's important to allow the freedom for schools and departments sometimes to have a, a set of beliefs and, and, and to represent that. I, I think what we have to do also is, is the question of how do you deal with the problem of bias? Because there is no unbiased way to deal with bias. And who do you trust to make these decisions? Ultimately, I think you have to trust the academic experts within departments and try and push them to make fair decisions and sometimes overturn them when they make clearly unfair decisions. But what you have to do is to allow them to make those academic decisions. What you can't do is have donors or trustees or administrators coming in from on high and saying, here's my point of view on what I'd like to see in this department and I'm going to force, you, force these hires on you. I'm going to force you not to hire these people because I don't like them. Uh, the, the problem of bias is a huge problem, uh, and, it, and it's uh, an enormous thing to, ch to deal with, but it's the best of all alternatives. In many ways, it's like democracy. It's a terrible system. It creates all of these things. The only thing is that it's better than every other possible alternative, and that's sort of my defense of freedom of bias on campus. Three things. Okay. One is, very good point, the whole reason we do these authors' nights. The, this is the first de debate we've had, not because we don't like liberals, no, <laughs> but because uh, we have had lots of conservative speakers, and the reason is we're trying to give interns on Capitol Hill speakers they're not likely to get on their college campuses unless they go to Liberty and a few other schools. Pensacola, and quite frankly, not likely to get even in a Republican-controlled House of Representatives in committee hearings. That segues into a little commercial I want to do, which is this event was made possible, as all of our conservative university authors' nights are, and we'll be having more, and we'll let you know when they are, by a grant from the Frank A. Fusco and Nellie Galetti Fusco Foundation. The other thing I want to point out is this. History courses, high school, grade school, college, have been passing on for, geez, a generation and a half or two now the notion that the founding fathers started America to protect their property. I would urge you to check out the book, 1776. By the way, check me on this. I found the best histories tend to be commercial ones because they've gone through a fact-checking department as opposed to textbooks where they pay professors for their names to approve it. I've gotten that from professors who've given their names for some. Now, David McCullough points out in his book, 1776, that that notion is patently ridiculous. How could that be the case in a country that had no banks and had to borrow money to fight a revolution? That's all I got for now.